Good morning and welcome to worship on this third Sunday after Pentecost. Glad you can be with us this morning. Before we begin worship, I'd like to ask Phil Coma to share with us some announcements. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. This is the third Sunday after Pentecost. So things are still on track for returning to our sanctuary for indoor worship together in person next Sunday, June the 20th. And we certainly look forward to seeing all of you there. Uh, for those who are unable to attend, we will also continue to stream our worship service on Zoom. And an additional reminder, uh, the 20th is the third Sunday of the month, and that's when we gather our loose offerings for uh, Faith Esperanza. So please remember to bring your loose change for next Sunday. Uh, we will continue to have community connection at this time. This is two o'clock on Tuesdays on Zoom, and the link can be found on our Gloria Day website. So adult, um, adult education for Wednesdays and for Sundays is on hiatus until the fall, and want to thank everyone for participating in the class on the Franciscan Way. Joys this week, um, we're celebrating Carl and Carol Irwin's wedding anniversary on Monday the 14th. And a reminder for those who are using Zoom, you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to submit your request for prayers of intercession. And please remember to send your tithes and your offerings or contribute online through our website, Gloria Day Lutheran Church, gdlclb.org. It's very important since we are unfortunately significantly behind in our contributions for this year. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Let's prepare our hearts for worship with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We want our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We, we take offense at your teaching and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus the worker of miracles, there's always more than enough. Through Jesus the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Let's join in singing our gathering song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
The prayer of the day, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Grant us into yourself and nurture our growth. Excuse me, Grant, graft, us in, unto, graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and love in those to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading this morning is from Ezekiel 17. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its twigs. I will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live in the shade of its branches, will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. Word of wisdom, word of life. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from 2 Corinthians. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yet, yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. For the love of Christ urges us on because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Word of wisdom, word of life. Thanks be, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the fourth chapter, beginning at the 26th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my Redeemer and my rock. Amen. With what can we compare the kingdom of God? 
What do you think of when you hear or read that phrase, the kingdom of God? I think it's hard for us to really grasp what Jesus was talking about when he talked about the kingdom of God, not only because he described it in metaphors and parables, but because the kingdom itself is a thing entirely outside of our experience for almost all of us. Most of us think of kingdoms in terms of physical territory, but clearly Jesus is talking about something that transcends mere physical boundaries. Kingdom can also mean a sphere of authority or rule, and that might be closer to what Jesus is getting at, the rule of God, the authority of God. But most of us can't relate too well to that because We've never lived under the authority of a monarch or a lord or a master. And those monarchies that are still active in our world are either almost entirely symbolic or wildly dysfunctional or utterly despotic. And I don't think we want to attribute any of those qualities to God. Also, words like authority and rule can have a coercive edge to them. And the kingdom, as Jesus describes it, seems to be much more about influence, persuasion, and cooperation. It's more organic. It's something that grows in us and around us and among us. I've often used the phrase kingdom of God for that reason, to try to capture some of the cooperative love-based nature of God's sovereign rule, as Jesus describes it in the Beatitudes and parables. And I think that might be more in the right direction, maybe. But it's also important to remember that the kingdom of God is not a democracy. God is sovereign. God's rule is absolute. Fortunately for us, so is God's love. And that love is the very fabric of this thing Jesus is trying to describe as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. When Jesus told these parables, and some 30 years later when Mark wrote them down, trouble was brewing in Galilee and Judah and pretty much throughout all of Palestine. Landowners were putting pressure on tenant farmers for rents they could barely pay. Scribes from the temple in Jerusalem were demanding a crushing and complex levy of tithes from those same farmers. Herod Antipas was demanding taxes from the landowners because Rome was demanding taxes from him. Unemployment was high. Bandits roamed the highways. Soldiers patrolled everywhere. Rome's colonial government was heavy-handed and oppressive. People wanted a heavenly anointed Messiah to step in and fix things before they exploded, or maybe to light the fuse. It's no wonder that the disciples kept asking Jesus, is this the time when you'll bring in the kingdom? Jesus kept trying to tell them and all the crowds following him, no, the kingdom of God is not like that. It's not what you're thinking. It won't do any good to simply replace one coercive external system with another one, even if the ruler is God. The change has to be internal. It has to be organic. Seeds have to be planted. Human hearts and minds have to be changed. It's not about imposing a new kind of law and order. It's about implanting a new kind of love and respect. That's what will fix the world. The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seeds on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. For generations, we had a family farm in Kansas, my mother's family farm, where we grew winter wheat. Winter wheat is planted in late September or early October, depending on the weather. Not long after it's planted, it starts to sprout, 
beautiful little shoots that look like blades of grass start to poke their heads up out of the soil. And then just as they're getting started, the cold hits them and it looks like it's killed them. They slump back down to the dirt and go dormant and they'll just lie there all through the winter. The ground will freeze, snow will drift and blanket over them and then there's nothing you can do. All winter long, you go about your business. You sleep and rise night and day. And then you get up one spring morning and you notice that the weather's a bit warmer and the snow is patchy or mostly gone. And you look out the window to see that you suddenly have a field full of beautiful green wheat starting to rise from the earth. It's an amazing thing to see. And if you have half a sense of wonder, you thank God for the natural everyday miracle of it and marvel at it for at least a moment before you get on with your work. The kingdom of God is like that, says Jesus. It's seeds scattered on the earth, seeds of ideas and vision, and sometimes it looks like they've died or been crushed or been frozen out or buried or simply forgotten. But they're there, just waiting for their moment. The kingdom of God is seeds of ideas and vision and understanding. They're ideas about fairness and justice and cooperation. They're an understanding about fuller and more generous ways to love each other and take care of each other. The kingdom is a resolve to make a world that's healthier for everyone. It's a resolution to embrace God's vision for how the world is supposed to work. A world where everyone is housed and everyone is fed and everyone can learn and everyone is safe. And everyone is free to be their true self. The kingdom is a determination to repair the damage we've done and restore creation so that we and all the creatures who share this world with us can breathe clean air and have clean water. The kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God, the kingdom of God is a commitment to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God and with each other. It's a continual correction of our vision. So we keep learning how to see the image and likeness of God in each other, in each and every face we face, so that racism and classism and every other kind of ism evaporate from the face of the earth. It's the seed of courage taking root in our hearts and minds so that we learn not to be afraid of something or someone simply because it or they are different from us or from what we know or what we expect or what we're used to. With what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it, said Jesus? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth, yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in it. <laughs> the mustard seed that tiny seed that produces the most egalitarian, most democratic of plants. That's what the kingdom is like. It shares itself and all that it has most freely. Given half a chance, it spreads itself everywhere. The mustard plant doesn't care if you're rich or poor. You don't have to buy one. It'll come to you and give you and your family food and medicine and spices for your cuisine and healing oils for what ails you. A most amazing, versatile, and humble plant. And it starts with such a small seed. 
The kingdom of God is the planting of seeds. The seeds don't have to be eloquent preaching or brilliant explanations of theology, probably better if it's not. Preach the gospel at all times, said St. Francis. When necessary, use words. At a time when the city of Assisi was a rough and dangerous place, he would walk through the town from the top of the hill to the bottom and say as he went, good morning, good people. When he got to the bottom of the hill, he would say to the brother who accompanied him, there, I've preached my sermon. He planted a seed, the reminder that the day was good and that they had it in them to be good people. The seeds of the kingdom may be little acts of habit. Lie bowing your head for a moment to say grace before a meal in a restaurant, even if you don't say it out loud. That simple thing might remind those around you to pause, to be thankful, to remember all the connections that bring food to our tables, to remember the goodness of the earth, to remember the presence of God. The seeds of the kingdom might be small acts of kindness. When Oscar Wilde was being brought down to court for his trial, feeling more alone and abandoned than he had ever felt in his life, he looked up and saw an old acquaintance in the crowd. He performed an action so sweet and simple that it has remained with me ever since, wrote Wilde. He simply raised his hat to me and gave me the kindest smile I've ever received as I passed by, handcuffed and with bowed head. Men have gone to heaven for smaller things than that. It was in this spirit and with this mode of love that the saints knelt down to wash the feet of the poor or stooped to kiss the leper on the cheek. I've never said one single word to him about what he did. I store it in the treasure house of my heart. That small bit of kindness brought me out of the bitterness of lonely exile into harmony with the wounded, broken, and great heart of the world. The seeds of the kingdom might be a word of affirmation and encouragement when it's needed most. Helen Mersola was teaching ninth graders new math years ago. They were struggling with it. The atmosphere in the classroom was becoming more tense and irritable every day. So one Friday afternoon, Helen decided to take a break from the lesson plan. She told her students to write down the name of each of their classmates on a piece of paper, then to also write down something nice about that student. She collected the papers and over the weekend, Helen compiled a list for each student of what the other students had written. On Monday, she gave each student a paper with a list of what the other students liked about them. The atmosphere in the class changed instantly. Her students were smiling again. Helen overheard one student whisper, I never knew that I meant anything to anyone. Years later, a number of the students, all young adults now, found themselves together again at a school function. One of them came up to Helen and said, I have something to show you. He opened his wallet and carefully pulled out two worn pieces of notebook paper that had obviously been opened and folded and taped many times. It was the list of things his classmates liked about him. I keep mine in my desk at work, said another classmate. Another classmate pulled hers out of her purse saying she carried it with her everywhere she went. Still another had placed his in his wedding album. The kingdom of God, the rule of God, the reign of God, the kingdom of God. 
to what shall we compare it? It's like ski seeds scattered on the earth, said Jesus. It's like mustard seeds, seeds of righteousness, seeds of justice, seeds of vision, seeds of kindness, seeds of help, seeds of hope, seeds of mercy, seeds of peace, seeds of affirmation, seeds of goodness, seeds of love. You don't know how they grow, but they do on earth as in heaven. Let us pray. Growing in faith, lifted by hope, guided by love, let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enliven your church so that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Creator, even the trees, shrubs, and flowers delight in your goodness. From the depths of the soil to the highest mountain, bring forth new plants. Restore growth to places suffering drought. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Judge of nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicate, dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sovereign God, this family of faith belongs to you. We give thanks and pray for the musicians who have added so much to our worship, especially Richard Hoover. We dedicate to you the joyful noise that comes from our hearts, the melody of voice and instruments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide relief to those who call on you. Bless all who suffer. We pray especially for Lance Hailstone, for Matthew Erickson, Harry Plummer, a baby Arthur, Peggy Bachman, Charlie Hartwell, Mike Engel, Janet Sims, Vicki Gammer, Jim Shoup, Diane Kyle, Judy Mello, Dee Peretta, Renee Wright, Brooklyn and her family, Chuck Dean, Ken Rhoda, and Pastor Steve. Reveal your power to heal and to save. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. All these prayers we lay before you, Holy Trinity, trusting in your abiding grace and love, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's join in singing our sending song for the fruit of all creation.
the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine on us and may the Lord be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and inspire us with seeds of the kingdom to scatter freely. And as we sow those seeds, may we know peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve each other to love and serve your neighbors, to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.